you in NCSE? Let's give it up, let's give it up. Okay, our next speaker is gonna have a little bit of a quick uh, speech going on, so I'm gonna try and make this as brief as possible. For those of you who have seen him at the November conference, uh, well, obviously, you know, he's a great speaker. And for those of you who haven't, uh, he, well, you're in for a treat. So, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Congressman Wesley Hunt. Wesley Hunt was born and raised in Houston, Texas, in a military family, and is a proud alumnus of St. John's School. Upon graduation from St. John's, Wesley accepted an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. After West Point, Wesley spent eight years in the Army as an aviation branch officer and a helicopter pilot. Wesley's service included one combat deployment to Iraq and two deployments to Saudi Arabia where he served as a diplomatic liaison officer. While in Saudi Arabia, Wesley represented the U.S. government in missions involving the Royal Saudi Land Forces Aviation Corps. Wesley is a lifelong conservative and is an active member of the community who has dedicated his time in military service and volunteer work to protect our country and improve the Houston area. Now he serves as the U.S. representative of Texas's 38th Congressional District, where he takes the fight to leftists in Congress armed with logic, wit, and wisdom. Without any further introduction, please welcome Congressman Wesley Hunt. Beat Navy. Good answer. Say, oh, don't get me started now. Just want to thank you all so much for having me. Uh, really appreciate it. And I love looking across rooms like this and seeing what I know is a very, very, very bright future. Frederick Douglass fam famously said, if there is no struggle, there's no progress. Those who profess freedom yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one or a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but there must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Well, under Joe Biden, we've struggled, but I can assure you in 2024, that will be the progress. We live in the greatest country in the world. Beat, beat Navy. We live in the greatest country in the world, and I'm gonna tell you why. My dad's a retired colonel in the Army, served for 23 years in the military. My sister went to West Point, my family first. Served 23 years active duty in the Army as a military intelligence officer. I went to West Point and my family second. By far the coolest because I flew Apaches in combat. Yeah, thank you. My brother's also a West Point graduate. And he served in the Navy for five years. There are 60 years worth of military service just in my immediate family. And I always lead with that story because that's the kind of service and sacrifice that it takes for us to wake up every single day and place our feet on free, sovereign American soil and breathe free, sovereign American air. Because Americans are willing to die for these freedoms that we must defend every single generation or they can be lost to the next. Anytime somebody asked me about how difficult times might be in this country, I say, you know what? I don't think you've met the young conservative, have you? I don't think you have met these vibrant young people that believe in the Constitution, that believe in the very ethos of what it means to be an American first. Because if you speak in rooms like this and you see young people like this, it gives me all the encouragement I need to ensure that we leave America better for you. Because that's the American way to leave it better than we found it. My great-great-grandfather was a slave. His name was Silas Crawford. He was born on Rosedown Plantation, 33 and a half miles north of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rosedown Plantation still exists today. I've been there. I've seen it. 
three, three of his great-great-grandchildren attended West Point. Three of his great-great-grandchildren served in the United States military. Three of his great-great-grandchildren earned multiple master's degrees from Ivy League schools. And the great-great-grandson of a slave is a United States congressman from Houston, Texas, in a white majority district that President Trump would have won by 23 points. I tell you that story because, well, that's the America that I see. That's the America that I believe in every single day. I am less interested with one's race, religion, color, or creed. I am far more interested in one's grit, work ethic, and the idea of understanding that the rising tide raises all boats. What you look like means nothing anymore in this country. The only thing that matters is preserving the values for this country so we can actually have one in the future. And we cannot allow the left to destroy it. Communism, Marxism, if you're, if you're paying attention, is now running rampant in our country. I just got, got out of a hearing today because I heard from a young lady that is competing against grown men in swimming. This is where we are at as a country. It's acceptable for grown men to compete against, uh, to compete against women. Now see, I really care about women because I have a two-year-old daughter, I have a four-year-old daughter. And when they wanna go out and use their time and their effort to become diligent in a craft, and they wanna compete, and they wanna work hard for it, I want them to compete against people in their gender. Why is that a crazy idea? But if we don't have people like you that are willing to stand up for righteousness, that will happen. I'm not going to be here forever. At some point, i got to pass this torch to you. And I'm going to entrust that you will continue to do the right thing as I have tried my best to do the right thing. Got a lot of West Point stories, but one of my favorite West Point stories of all time is this. The barracks and the statues at West Point are named after prominent West Point graduates like Grant and Eisenhower and MacArthur and General George S. Patton, who is my personal favorite general of all time. His statue is prominently displayed in front of the library with his back facing the library because he graduated last in his class and apparently he never read a book. <laughs> and of course, there's Robert E. Lee Barracks, the Confederate general. And I lived a semester and Robert E. Lee Barracks, the Confederate general that fought against the rights of people that looked like me. And every time I walked beneath that threshold, I thought to myself, damn, this is a great country. Because it serves as a reminder of the progress. And if it were named anything differently, then I wouldn't have that perspective. I am not judged by the name on a building or by a statue. I'm judged, I'm judged by being an American. I'm judged by being a husband, a father, a combat veteran, a West Point grad, an Apache pilot. And I'm, I like being black too, it's pretty cool, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but that's the progress that we must continue to celebrate and build on. I start off by saying this is the greatest country in the world, and I mean that, because I'm somebody that has spent a couple of years abroad. See, when I was in Saudi Arabia in 2010 through 2012, women didn't have the right to operate a motor vehicle. I've seen tyranny. I know what dictators look like. And this is why people must understand that even on our worst day, this is still the best place to be in the world. Do not let the left lie to you. Do not let the left tell you that Wesley Hunt doesn't exist. Do not let the left tell you that conservatism isn't cool, because it's beyond cool. It's the American way. 
14 of my West Point classmates are no longer here. They died in the global war on terror. They didn't see the age of 26 years old. By the way, all 14 of them were white males. And when they gave their last full measure, I can assure you, they didn't die for white people or for black people or for Hispanic people or for Asian people. They died for you. They died for all Americans. This is the fight that we face every single day. It is incumbent upon every single person in this room to honor their sacrifice and to continue to find ways to serve for those who are no longer here to serve for themselves. And if you're here, that means you're in the fight with us. Roosevelt famously said, it's not the critic that counts, nor how the man points out how the strong man stumbles nor how the doer of deeds could have done them better, but the credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually strives to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms and the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, even if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls that neither know victory nor defeat. If you're in this room right now, it means you're willing to join me and join our movement in the arena. And I look across this room and I tell you what, I cannot ask for a better, for a better set of battle buddies than you brave patriots that are taking time out of your day to preserve conservatism for the future. I am truly honored by your presence. This is way better than taking votes on the House floor. <laughs> like, way better. But thank you for being here. God bless you all. All right, we're going to start our Q&A segment. Again, hey, yeah. Just a couple of questions. All right, if you'll just line up at the back there where you normally would and come up, state your name, where you go to school, and a brief question. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Thomas Adcock, Kansas State University, uh, U.S. Army Gallery from 2018 to 2021. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sir. So while I was in, I got told I was too patriotic and he'd be less proud to be No American such thing. By one of my NCOs. So how would you in Congress, I'm sorry, lots of breath. Very good. How would you in Congress uh, want to combat the negativity within the military with that mindset of our leaderships today? So that's, a, that's a great question. So if you're looking at what's happening with recruiting right now, it's because they are literally trying to demonize people like you by saying that you're too patriotic. By the way, for those of you listening, that there's literally no such thing as being too patriotic. Because just like I talked about, people died for our freedoms. So every time we talk about patriotism, we are honoring those that pay the ultimate sacrifice for us to be able to be here right now. There's no such thing as that. But if you're watching what the left is doing right now by making patriotism not great, well, guess what? People then don't want to serve the country. When you're more worried about pronouns and you're more worried about your gender instead of war fighting in the military, then that 18-year-old, 19, 20-year-old young man and young woman that wants to just go serve their country and honor those that came before them gets discouraged because they believe that the leadership in this country isn't patriotic enough. Now, the good thing is, is this. We can fix this in 2024. This is a leadership issue because prior to this administration, I mean, I really did like watching the 4th of July uh, party that Trump had. I thought it was actually really cool. Great fireworks, big stuff, big everything. It was absolutely wonderful at Mount Rushmore. More of that, please. 
And then I think when you turn this around, you're going to start to see people say, you know what? This is our fight, and I'm in it. Not our first rodeo in this country. I don't know if y'all recall this. This is way before your time. It was way before my time, actually. But in the late 60s and 70s, we had Vietnam veterans that would return home from war, and they were being spat on by fellow Americans. During Jimmy Carter's time, we had hyperinflation. We had low patriotism. All these issues that we're seeing right now, this just happened, like right before I was born. It's now come back full circle. And how do we respond? With arguably one of the most patriotic times we've seen in the history of this country with Ronald Reagan. And guess what? It's going to happen again. Thank you for your question. Ashley Cope. I'm a student at California Lutheran University. Hi. And I was going to ask you, do you think military service should be required in the United States? For, uh, to, to serve in Congress? Or, or, no, or just military required service. In general? Mm -hmm. So I would be a proponent of every single American taking a year or two and some sort of service. I don't want to make error. I wouldn't say I want everybody to be in the military because that's not for everyone. But figuring out a way to serve in like the Peace Corps, for example, or working for a nonprofit for a year, or going into the military for, for, for a year, or, I don't know, working at, a, working at a fire department, anything, any form of service for a year after your senior year of high school is something that I would be a proponent of. I've been to Israel twice in my life. And the one thing that I know is about Israel is everyone has to serve. And therefore, people then have a certain level of respect for their freedoms because they're giving up their time and their life to understand it. The problem that we have in this country is we have a lack of people, unlike the people in this room, thank God you're still here, we have a lack of people that don't understand what it means to serve. Now, it doesn't have the military, but some form of service would be something that I would love to see happen in this country. Thank you. All right, this will be our last question. Hi, Congressman. Thank you very much for being with us today. My Thank name you. is Tyler Seaman, and I go to Gettysburg College. Go Bullets. There you go. Uh, next summer, I will be uh, accepting an OCONUS internship assignment at a combatant command, and my question for you is what way uh, can I best support that staff, or perhaps more broadly for everybody, uh, what is one way we can best support staffs that we are interning for? Oh, yeah, great. Um, I am blessed to have the best staff on Capitol Hill. I have the best chief of staff on the Hill. I have the best comms director on Capitol Hill, and I'm convinced of that. And the reason why we do so well as a team is because not just those two guys, but everybody else follows suit. They just work their tails off. That's it. And they believe that this is actually a form of service because the pay certainly ain't worth it. But the mission is. And if you can imagine that the work that you do actually helps making, actually helps to make the laws of the land for the future and to continue this fight for our country, it's the thing that's kind of like within us all. It's that greater cause. It's that greater fight. So the only thing I'd ask you to do is be a team player, understand the greater good, humble yourself, and know that what you're doing matters. Because most people your age are sitting at home playing Xbox, living in their mom's basement. <laughs> and you are choosing to find a way to continue to serve your country. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Okay, that's gonna be the end of our Q&A. Thank you, Congressman Hunt. Let's God give a round you. of applause. Thank you all so much, really appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you. everyone how are we doing so far well I promise our next speaker does not disappoint Abby Roth is the creator of classically Abby a YouTube channel and lifestyle brand that teaches about classic living and traditional values she is a classically trained opera singer with a master's degree and professional study certificate from the Manhattan School of Music 
Abby transitioned to YouTube from Opera when she realized the importance of sharing how to live a conservative life. With over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, 98,000 followers on Instagram, and 83,000 followers on Twitter, Abby is spreading her message to young women and men everywhere. Please get it up for Abby Roth. so much to the team at YAF for organizing this incredible event. Today, I want to talk to you all about the ways I've screwed up. OK, to be more specific, I want to share with you all the ways I messed up in college. I think a lot of the time, it can seem like the people who are standing up here talking to you had it all figured out from day one. We knew what we believed and why we believed it. We understood all of the things that we talked about, but that is simply not true. What was your impression of what college was supposed to be like? My impression from media and pop culture was that college was basically a nonstop alcohol and drug-induced party that would forever be remembered as the best years of my life. Of course, there were classes, and there was learning and studying and libraries and all of that. But if you really only focused on your studies, you were missing out on what college was really all about. I'm sure some, if not all of you, understand that feeling, that you're supposed to be doing college in this specific way, that you're supposed to be going out there, experimenting. <laughs> I grew up knowing that wasn't going to be my college experience because I was raised religiously, so I wasn't going to treat college like a four-year hedonistic spree. That wasn't going to happen for me. That wasn't something I was looking for. but. There was still that feeling that if I didn't take advantage of my time in college, I was missing out on the full experience. You can know what's good and right, but if you're immersed and surrounded in leftist ideology, which we all are, you'll often question what's good and right, especially in these formative years where you're still determining what your worldview is, where you're still figuring things out and what people tell you in the vast majority of things that you're consuming is one way when your traditional values are telling you something different. I ended up making plenty of mistakes, and I learned from them. I hope that by sharing some of my own, you all can keep me in mind when you're close to making mistakes yourselves. Of course, you'll all make mistakes. I'm sure you've already made many. But I made enough bad decisions that I hope you don't have to make quite as many. So how can you actually make the most of your time at college? How can you go, feel proud of what you accomplished, and leave better than when you started? Well, you can leave college with foggy memories of parties and hookups come and gone. Or you can leave college with friendships that will last a lifetime maybe a soulmate, a strong understanding of your faith and values, and a degree that's actually worth something. You can take your first steps into adulthood and set your feet in the direction of your future. So let me share five lessons with you and how I learned them the hard way. Okay, number one, practice your leftist BS comprehension. When I was in my first year of college, one of my requirements was to take a writing class. Our professor started the class by showing us that everything around us had bias. So he drew a graph. On one side, he put the right, and he wrote fox. OK, fair enough. On the left, he put MSNBC. Also fair enough. Probably could have put CNN, but he put MSNBC. In the middle, what do you think he put as not having a bias? John Stewart. John Stewart was what he put as not having a bias because comedy was never political. Now, if any of you have watched anything comedic in the last 10 years, you'll know that comedy is either so political it's not funny or so politically correct it's not funny. Now, 
if you know anything about Jon Stewart, you'll know that he is anything but moderate or middle of the road. And even though he presented many things as fact, his goal was really to make conservatives look stupid. I also had to take a social course. This one was called Changing Family Forms. You can imagine what that class was like, and you'd be right. The professor shared a list of fascist dictators and communist leaders and asked us what they had in common. Was it that they were tyrannical murderers who killed millions of people? No, no, of course not. The answer was that they all came from stable two-parent households. And apparently that proved that coming from a traditional background doesn't at all guarantee positive outcomes. Now, I caught the leftism in these classes because I was looking for it and it was kind of obvious it would be there. But I was also an opera student. None of my music classes were particularly political. And so I didn't even notice the inherent leftist bias that was being presented to me by my professors. If your professors have a bias, even if they're not talking about something political, they'll kind of let it seep in and ooze in as they talk about what they're interested in. So I didn't question it. And therein lies mistake number one. I didn't practice my leftist BS comprehension, like reading comprehension. Everything you watch, everything you read, everything you listen to, and every class you take is trying to convince you of something. It's your responsibility to learn how to recognize it. Get good at hearing the bias in everything presented to you, whether it be on your own side or someone else's. A good example is the new Barbie movie. Conservatives wanted to believe, there were a, a good number of conservatives who wanted to believe that this movie was going to be a return to real femininity and embracing beauty, right? We saw girls in pretty pink dresses. Isn't that what femininity is all about? But that movie, which I didn't want to see, but I did for you, <laughs> it had the most obvious woke agenda I've seen in a long time. It wasn't only unwatchable from a quality perspective. It was a feminist diatribe hating and deriding men. Now, if you know who Greta Gerwig is, the director, and if you knew it's you know, Hollywood generally, which is a woke pit, you could have imagined that this movie was not going to be a conservative's dream. But if you're a young person who sees girls in pretty dresses and thinks, I'm just going to see a movie, you might not be prepared for the bias being thrown your way. In 2020, 98% of Cornell's employee and professor donations went to Democrat candidates and left-leaning political action committees, 98%. That's just an example of what you're dealing with on college campuses. Leftist thought and ideology dominates classrooms. I'm sure you've all experienced it. You will constantly be bombarded with the other side's positions as if they are fact. It will be stated as if it's obvious and no one could disagree. It's up to you to realize it, think about it, and know what your response is. Honing this craft in college will prepare you for the real world, where you will be facing this all the time. Number two, loneliness leads to bad decisions. During my time at college, I was studying vocal performance. I was an opera singer. I was afraid to become a member of YAF or the College Republicans because I knew if my colleagues found out, I'd be blacklisted. Everyone there thinks the same thing. Everyone in the arts generally, but in opera as well, thinks the same thing. And so if you think something different, if you are on the right, you will not get a job. So I didn't want anyone to find out. My class was so small, nine people overall, okay? Imagine that in a college of thousands of people, my class, the people I took all of my classes with, nine people, <clears throat> that I didn't have a ton of people to share my views with. In order not to be lonely, I grew very close with the circle of friends in my program. We did share a common interest, music, but we didn't have shared values. To stave off the loneliness, I began making bad decisions. I'd go to parties I shouldn't have, I stayed out late with people, when I knew I'd regret it the next day, I even developed a crush on someone I should never be with. I'll talk about that more later. 
And I made bad decisions rather than being lonely. So that was mistake number two, letting myself be lonely. Loneliness is the number one indicator of bad decision making. People will do anything to avoid loneliness because it's an unnatural human state. People were not meant to be alone. We were meant to be in families and communities and relationships. We will change everything about ourselves if it means we will have friends to hang out with. We will change our values, our opinions, our faith, and everything that matters to us. Don't let it get to that point. Make friends with people who do share your values, who do share your faith, who can bolster you and who you are. Because the truth is, you will actually get lonelier and lonelier the more you lose yourself to fit in. And then when you are by yourself, you won't recognize who you are anymore. You aren't the core of who you are at all. You've covered it with all of the lies of the people you've changed yourself to fit in to be with. Instead of compromising your values to make friends, make friends who share your values and you'll have friendships that last a lifetime. That's what's great about these kinds of conferences. You can meet people who share your values. Loneliness is such a pervasive problem that it leads me right into my next two pieces of advice. Number three, don't let yourself stay quiet about things that matter. Speak out, be confident, be bold, and embrace the repercussions. I didn't speak up in college for a few reasons. One, I wasn't confident in what I had to say. And to be honest, maybe I shouldn't have been because I didn't take the time to research my positions. I kind of grew up in a household that believed certain things, and I took that as true, and never really did my own research into it. So I didn't feel confident that I could defend it if somebody came up against that. Two, I was afraid of hurting my chances in the opera industry. But there's one story that sticks in my head every time I think about it. When I was at the Manhattan School of Music getting my master's degree, I was waiting backstage in rehearsal. In the green room, which is kind of the room where people hang out, but you can't hear them backstage, a few of my colleagues were sitting on the floor discussing abortion. Now, being pro-life was something I was always really interested in, so I was actually well-educated on the topic. I've always been very passionate about, about being pro-life, about pregnancy, about how that kind of thing happens, that miracle of life. And so I always knew a lot about that topic. And so when I saw my friends talking about abortion, being very ill-informed, saying things that really had no basis in fact, and also were emotionally driven arguments, but in the wrong direction, I didn't say anything. I didn't speak up at all. I didn't have to be combative. I didn't have to come in and be like, you're wrong, here's why. But I could have easily just asked some questions. This is something I learned from my husband, that sometimes a very good way to change someone's mind is not to actually fight with them, but to ask questions that get them to think about it. Oh, are you really sure that that's how life begins? Like, when does life begin, and is that important to you? You know, that kind of thing. That was mistake number three. I stayed quiet when I could have spoken out, when I could have changed someone's mind. Obviously, as I've gotten older, I've read more, I've informed myself, and I've made a career out of saying the truth. I've got a ton of haters. The number of awful comments I get is too many to count. Feel free to check out any of my YouTube videos and you'll see. People often ask me if I care about it. How do I handle all the hate that I get, all the trolls? And the truth is I, I don't care. Why? Because I'm speaking the truth. And when you're speaking the truth, whatever anyone says that's the opposite is wrong. Whatever someone says in the comments that's mean is just wrong. An influencer friend of mine recently ran into some controversy and called me asking what to do about it. People were sending her hate comments, were sending her hate in, the, in her DMs. There were two things I had to say to her. One, if you're going to take strong positions, ones that you know are right, you have to be okay with the repercussions. You have to be confident and you have to be strong. And that's great. It means you're doing something right if people are trying to fight with you in the comments. And fighting is, if you're going to be in a fight, it means there's someone on the other side. 
Number two, you don't always have to respond to things. I've made a career out of not responding to people. You don't have to apologize and you don't have to explain yourself. You do not have to apologize. That's a big one. You can simply say the truth and take responsibility for having said it by not discussing it further. Done. I said what I said. Thank you so much for your input. Educate yourselves. Learn more about what you think and why you think it. Then speak out. The truth is, you should choose a career where you can say what you think. I'm not saying you need to choose a career where you literally, as your job, say what you think, but I'm saying you need to choose a career where if you talk about your views, you're not gonna get fired. If people are talking about politics in the workplace, it can't be one-sided. You don't wanna build your life on sand, where all of a sudden, you're constantly trying to keep silent about your views, so no one finds out that you're actually a conservative. And then someone does, and everything comes crashing down. You should live in a community of people that allow you to speak your thoughts openly, if not actually support those values themselves. It's our responsibility to speak the truth. And if you're in a career trajectory that doesn't allow that, you will find yourself less and less happy there, even if you love what you do. Why? Well, it connects back to loneliness. You'll be alone. You'll be silent. You'll be silenced. Speaking out allows you to make real friends. The friends you make in college that last are the friends that can, you can call 10 years down the road when your lifestyle reflects your traditional values. The friends I made in college, I talked to basically none of them. Why? Because as soon as our shared interest, music, wasn't the primary part of my life, our values were too different. We didn't mesh anymore. We didn't make sense. Music will always be a love of mine, but it would never have been enough to fill my life with meaning. Now, I live every day grateful for the purpose I find in the things that really matter. But the friends I made in college would not agree with where I'm at. And it means that we can't really stay close. Saying the truth is more important now than ever. We are in a culture war. And if we want our children to live in a world without drag queen story hour at the library, we have to voice our concerns. It's up to us and it's up to you. Use your time in college to speak out, learn more, and build friendships on strong foundations. Number four, don't let your faith get weaker during college. Instead, let it grow and become stronger. When I was at the University of Southern California, there wasn't a huge Orthodox Jewish community. But the truth is, I really didn't seek it out. I didn't even head to the closest other college, UCLA, which did have a big Jewish community. I just treated my faith as something I could practice on my own. And I didn't seek out others who shared it. Faith is not purely personal. It's also communal. You can't depend on your personal relationship to God to carry you through the hard times when you're in college and you're getting attracted to so many things but from so many different people with so many different wor worldviews. You need a community to support you. As a result, my faith began to waver. Opera took precedence. My singing career became more important than my relationship to God and my practice of Judaism. And that was my fourth mistake. I took my faith for granted. It is so easy to put other things above your religion when you're busy with everything else. When you've made friends with people who don't believe in God and who spend their time doing everything except prayer and worship. But a college is not the place to let your, strength, to let your faith weaken. It's the place to strengthen your faith. Find a church, find a synagogue, find a community of people who bolster your faith. If you surround yourself with people who also share your religion, you will naturally find yourself investing more in your relationship with God. And if you don't, that pesky loneliness will pop its head in and lead you toward whatever the closest group of peers are doing, which may have nothing to do with faith at all. You will do what you need to have friends. And if that means putting your faith, your relationship to God on the back burner, 
You will. Start a Bible study group. Treat college as an amazing place to learn more about your faith with people who you've never met before. It's really interesting to talk to people from different walks of life and get their perspectives on God, on religion. Instead of treating college as a hedonistic opportunity to act in ways you'll regret, use this as the time to prepare yourself for how you'd like to approach your faith in the future. I know that my relationship with God was tenuous at best in college, and that didn't make me happier, despite the fact that it looked on paper like I had more freedom. Everything will tell you nowadays that religion is oppressive, and that without religion, you can go out and do whatever you want. And isn't that what real freedom is? Freedom outside of God is worship of everything else. Alcohol, partying, money, sex, even studying if it comes at the cost of going to prayer services every Sunday. It's worship of desire, which is never freedom. So allow yourself to develop and grow your relationship to God, deepen it and nourish it, along with others who support and believe in the same things you do. Number five, date seriously and with purpose. At USC, in order to stave off loneliness, I began making good friends with people who didn't share my values, as I mentioned, and that meant I developed a big crush on a guy who was not right for me. We had a lot of chemistry, but in every other way, we didn't make sense. I wanted to marry a Jew because I wanted to raise my children with my faith. He wasn't Jewish. He would get high and not go to class. Like, it was stuff that would never have made us compatible. And he developed a crush on me, too, which was even more cruel because I knew that I couldn't be with him, but he had no such reason not to fall head over heels. I got emotionally involved with someone who was wrong for me in every way, and I hurt him in the process. And that's the last mistake I'll share today. Don't get sucked into the modern culture of dating whoever you have chemistry with. Date seriously and with purpose. Know what dating is for. Dating for fun is a misnomer. It's not fun at all, in fact. It's quite upsetting to spend a lot of time with someone whose company you enjoy, who you have chemistry with, maybe you even hook up with, and then to go through the inevitable breakup that breaks your heart. Doesn't sound fun. It's a waste of time and a waste of energy. Dating seriously is great because it leads you to the right person faster. <laughs> then, when you're with the person you'll end up with, dating is fantastic because you are just hanging out with someone you like all the time. And you have a future, so you're not constantly on tenterhooks. College is the perfect time to date for marriage. This is the time to find someone you can build a life with because there are so many people for you to meet. Everyone is single, everyone is looking. Everyone is lonely, which is a good thing <laughs> in that sense. It's much harder once you're out of college, to be honest. And yes, even this connects back to loneliness. I have a friend who has dated multiple women who were wrong for him. He often will date women who he knows he can't have a future with. We talked about it, and it became clear that he was evading loneliness himself by dating women so that he had someone to spend his time with. He was filling up the time between serious girlfriends, theoretically, by just dating to date, which really meant he never had a serious girlfriend because he didn't have time to find the right person. He was stretching out the time in which he would actually be lonely because he would never find the right person if he was wasting his time with any person. So how do you find that person? Well, you use my patented, classically Abbey theory of chemistry and compatibility. That's how you do it. Uh, you guys have all heard of chemistry and compatibility, I'm sure. It's a common phrase. But I talk about it a little bit differently. You all may have experienced dating your chemistry person and your compatibility person. And there's the right person who has both. So what's your chemistry person? Your chemistry person is the person that you can stay up talking to all night. You just know that your personalities are perfect for each other. It's infatuating. It's incredible. But you also have nothing in common, and you're totally incompatible. 
It's the person that you convince yourself you could never break up with because you are perfect for one another from a chemistry perspective. But he doesn't want to get married. He doesn't want to have kids. He doesn't believe in God. Like, there are big questions that are just not getting answered in the right way. This is the person that will break your heart because you couldn't have believed that it would end. And this is the one that's going to be the most confusing based on our cultural depictions of love. We will think that chemistry person is the person, the right person, because of the passion. Now, let me explain what this kind of passion looks like. This kind of passion looks like feeling like I cannot bear to lose this person. Feels like you're on a roller coaster. And it's very exhilarating when you're at the top and very upsetting when you're at the bottom. But what that passion really is, is anxiety. You know that this doesn't have a future. You know that there's no way that this can really end well because you don't have compatibility. And so you convince yourself that it won't end, but it does. Compatibility person. This is the person you date who checks off everything that you have on your list, checks off all the boxes, makes perfect sense. Like, of course you should end up with this person, but you don't really like spending time with them. So it kind of makes sense, but at the end of the day, you don't really want to be with them, so you break up, and you don't have a heartbreak at all, but you're kind of questioning. It made sense that we should be together. On paper, we look like a perfect match. Shouldn't we be together? Well, no, because <laughs> you need both. The right person has both. The right person is the person you stay up all night talking to and the person that you also have a future with. And with this person, it's not going to feel that, like that anxiety, which we confuse for passion. It's going to feel calm and like home because there's no reason you would break up. There's no reason you would ask the question, what would happen if I lose this person? Because you wouldn't. And that's the feeling you should be looking for when you're dating for marriage. <laughs> Don't let the idea of sowing your wild oats in college lead you to have sex with random people or even just people you're in a relationship with, but aren't married to. There's nothing better than having someone know you and understand you fully. That's the real cure for loneliness. That's the thing that will give you fortitude, joy, and solace at every turn. And that can only be accomplished with one person who you share yourself completely with because you know you have your whole lives to live together. So let's recap the five lessons you should learn from my mistakes. One, practice your leftist BS comprehension. Two, loneliness leads to bad decisions. Three, don't let yourself stay quiet about things that matter. Speak out, be confident, be bold, and embrace the repercussions. Four, don't let your faith get weaker during college. Instead, let it grow and become stronger. And five, date seriously and with purpose. As you all make your way through college, you have lots of opportunities, good and bad. You can become better or worse. You can grow or stagnate. You can become who you were meant to be, or you can indulge in the worst parts of yourself. I made plenty of mistakes and had to learn some major lessons. You'll make mistakes too. I'm sure you've already made some. But using your time at college as wisely as you can, trusting in God and in your own intuition to do right, these can be some of the most fruitful years of your lives. We all believe in you, so believe in yourselves. You've got this. All right, we'll be starting another Q&A section. If you want to line up at the back, just where you were last time, you can come up and state your name or you go to school and a brief question. Hello, Abby. My name is Isabel from Regent School of Law. I've watched you online for years, so this is pretty cool. <laughs> I know that you are a wife, a mother, and you're a conservative woman who has pursued impactful work. 
As someone who wants to do that as well, how can women properly balance pursuing family and meaningful work? Thank you so much for your question. I would say the most important place for men and women to make a difference is within their own homes and within their own communities. So getting married, raising good kids, growing the, the community that you have is step one, right? We, we don't want to get distracted with everything out there that we can change if we can do a lot of great work at home. And, and so I recently did a reel talking about how you know, people accuse me. They're like, <laughs> I'm sure you saw. Uh, I, I recently did a reel saying people accuse me of like, oh, you say that women should be at home, but you make content and you do speeches. And I broke down what my day-to-day -day actually looks like, which is I work about eight hours a week while my son is napping. Like, <laughs> And this speech it happens very rarely. And while I'm gone, my mom and my husband watch my baby. So it's, and I leave for as short a time as possible. So the main thing is prioritizing family. If you can make that work and also do something outside of that that is affecting a, a larger group and is doing something great in the movement, I think that is a wonderful use of your time. It just always has to be balanced with what is happening right at home. And so for me, the best place I can be is raising my son and teaching him how to be an amazing member of society, a good conservative with strong traditional values. That's gonna make a bigger difference than truly anything I do here, even though I love being here. So coming here, doing this, is, can only ever be if it's not coming at the cost of what's going on at home. So if you can balance those two things, more power to you, and I, I encourage it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks so much uh, for your talk today. My name is Chuck Schumer. I'm a senior at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, my question for you, so I am a proud Catholic. Um, however, many of my classmates and colleagues are either non-religious or they don't take their religion seriously at all, um, what message can I share for them uh, to perhaps get away from the hedonism we see on college campuses and um, not take for granted what we have? Yeah, I think so. I just recently read a book called Conservatism by Yoram Hazoni. And in it, he just talks about how important it is to understand where so many of the values we live with as Americans, but also just as, as human beings, come from and stem from. And the truth is, they mostly stem from God. So if you're trying to share a, a message with your friends to, for, from this perspective, okay, so there's two parts. Let's start here. With, from that perspective of saying, like, there is value to God and there is value to all this. And let me explain where it comes from and why. I think that's a really good way to start the conversation because I think a lot of people think that God is outmoded, that people can uh, reason their way to morality, which is not true. So starting there. And then as far as encouraging your friends away from hedonistic lifestyles, I would say wait till the moment they see from their own experience that things are not great. <laughs> In the sense that when you do these hedonistic things, get really drunk, wake up the next morning, feel awful, feel bad about your decisions, whatever it is, that's a good time to be like, yeah, maybe this isn't the best choice. And it's not taking advantage of a, of a friend who's going through a bad time to help encourage them in a better direction and help encourage them in making better choices. So if you see them going through that, that's the time for you to step in and say, yeah, let's, you know what? Instead of saying, don't do that anymore, be like, hey, you want to go to the library? You want to go see a movie? You want to go do something fun that maybe isn't this hedonistic thing that you're experimenting with? Yeah, thank you so much. Hello, thank you so much for being here. My name is Aiden Jones. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Superior. Uh, and as someone who studies the arts, uh, filmmaking and theater, as well as uh, music, uh, vocal performance, um, I've definitely seen firsthand the impact of uh, left-wing politics in those spaces. Um, so my question for you is kind of two parts. One, why do you th what do you think it is about the arts that draws uh, leftists to them? And then also, what can we do as conservatives to retake that sphere of our society? So I, let's start with part two first. I think part two is we, I don't think, so there's a, there's a, there's a risk right now, right, of if you come out and say your views as a, as a person on the right, you're just not going to get jobs in these, in these industries. So I think what we have to do is we have to start speaking out, and whether that means we don't get jobs there and start creating our own, you know, areas of, of the arts where art, we want to make it better, not worse than what they're doing. 
and we want to make it um, from a good perspective that people can watch and, and enjoy, and we want to build our own community within that, which theoretically could have openness so that people from the left can come work in our industries. That's, I think, the only way we're going to be able to proceed in the arts. I think we have to be brave, and we have to say what we believe, and if that means we have to kind of start our own section of the of Hollywood or whatever it is, then that that is what it is. Um, as far as what attracts leftists to the arts, I think it's this this hedonism and this idea of like of freedom and the idea of we we want to be able to do whatever we want to express ourselves and freedom. Like I said, it, it can't freedom as just freedom doesn't mean anything. It means being worshiping everything and being caught in a desire spiral that that just traps you in that. So. I think that's what ends up drawing a lot of leftists to the arts, and they think of religion as oppressive and oppressive of creativity, which is very sad because it's not true. And if you look in our history, like in, far back in history, some of the greatest artists were people with 25 kids. Bach, I'm talking to you. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I think that's probably what it is. Thank you so much. Abby, thank you so much for being here. My name is Annalie Blomquist, and I'm a student at Mount Liberty College in Salt Lake City, Utah. And my question for you is, are there any books that have really impacted you um, that you would recommend to those of us seeking to be conservatives in this crazy world? That is a great question, and yes. <laughs> I was literally thinking of making a tweet about this the other day. So I think if you read, and you guys just had him speak to you, Carl Truman's, the right, um, Carl Truman's book, which I'm, the name is escaping me right now, but read Carl Truman's book. It's great. Um, and then you read that along with Conservatism, which I just mentioned. And then you read that along with The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. Those three things all inform each other. Those three books inform each other and can give you a really good perspective on how we've gotten to where we are today, why the world has become more leftist than ever, and what we can do to combat it. Thank you so much. Good morning, Mr. Roth. My name is Mary Frances McNulty, and I go to DeSales University, located in Pennsylvania. As you mentioned, a box office hit this summer is the Barbie movie, which portrays men as weak and pathetic. This perception of men is also reflected in our social media and pop culture. My question to you is, do you think this is a new feminism in which women are men's superior rather than equal? And if so, what impact will it have on our society? So that's, I, I love that question. I would not say it's a new form of feminism because I think that has been in the works for a while. So essentially, you, another good book to read, <laughs> uh, Christina Hoff Summers' Who Stole Feminism will help you understand this. Um, so essentially, there's an idea of gender feminism. We started off with first wave feminism, which was, OK, equal rights for everybody, and we're going to have you know, women vote. Then we had second wave feminism, third wave feminism. But gender feminism, which is what we live in under, is the idea that there are oppressors and there are those who are oppressed. The oppressed are women, and we will always be oppressed because the oppressors are men. And that is just how society functions, and there is no way for us to overcome that. No matter how wealthy you are, no matter how high you rise in your career, women are always going to be the victims. If we view things that way, then the only way to flip it is to deride men and say, oh, they're terrible, they're stupid. But even as we're saying that, right, if you saw the Barbie movie, even as we're saying that, they're the patriarchy, they're able to run everything. Women must be so bad at everything that they are able to be taken over by the Kens who are stupid, who are absolutely dumb. It doesn't make any sense in the Barbie movie. Um, but I think that it's an easy way to, to, to make dynamics easier to work with when feminists can believe that they're the victims of stupid people. Like, we're the victims of people who don't even have a right to have this oppressor position. And that, I mean, all of it is wrong from the bottom up. Men and women are equal, especially in Western society. We are very lucky to live in Western society where men and women have equal rights, where men and women have different roles, but an amazing role in each way. 
Uh, but I think that it is definitely going to affect things poorly if women go into the world thinking that men are stupid, that their sons are stupid, that their husbands are stupid. This is a terrible way to embrace relationships, and we should all be grateful for the differences and the special uniqueness of each gender. Thank you so much. Hi, Abby. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Nicholas Mann. I go to the University at Buffalo. And as a Catholic, my question is, how do I, who has traditional morals such as waiting for marriage, how do I change the hearts and minds of people on my college campus? So from a, just a friendly perspective, I think asking of d explaining your positions and why they work. I think a lot of people are not so open to hearing things from a religious perspective anymore, unfortunately. We, it's, even though I, I, I think it's important to explain where morals come from, where morality comes from, I don't think that a lot of people can accept that. So from a practical perspective, which is how I attempt to talk about sex and modesty and all of these things, I don't talk about them from a religious perspective, despite the fact that, for me, they stem from a religious place. I can justify all of my positions logically. So why shouldn't you have sex before marriage? There's like 150 billion reasons why. So let's go through them one by one, right? You know, there's, if you can break down to your friends why what they're doing is actually going to be worse for them in the long run, and maybe that means for you taking some time and breaking it down for yourself, then I think that can help. And always coming at it from a perspective of friendship rather than educating. Because if you talk to people, if you talk down to people, they're not going to hear you. But if you talk across the table to people and say, oh, let, tell me why you think this is a good idea, and I want to tell you why I think this is a good idea, then people are more open to hearing it. Thank you so much. OK, we are short on time. So unfortunately, that is going to conclude our Q&A. OK, thank you so much, everybody. Born and raised in Venezuela, Daniel DiMartino experienced the terrible consequences of socialism firsthand. Coming to the United States in 2016, he dedicated himself to explaining how socialism destroyed his homeland, advocating for its freedom, and stopping the ideology from ever being implemented in America. Daniel is a PhD candidate in economics at Columbia University and a graduate fellow at the Manhattan Institute, where he focuses on high-skill immigration policy. In addition to his economic research on immigration and his media appearances, Daniel founded the Dissident Project to teach high school students about the evils of the socialist regimes. Let's welcome Daniel DiMartino! How's it going? Um, has anybody here been to Burger King before? Yes, of course. Um, I don't recommend junk food, but I'll say I used to go to Burger King a lot when I was a kid, and until one time, I go with my parents, who, we actually went to the drive-thru, this is in Caracas, in Venezuela, and then they tell us, can we offer you a chicken sandwich instead? And I say, what do you mean? I'm asking for uh, a burger, you know? Um, and then they tell me, well, you know, today we don't have beef, we only have chicken. I'm like, if I wanted to get a chicken sandwich, I would have gone to KFC, uh, which we had KFC, you know, and, and we loved it, but, you know, we wanted meat. 
And it began that way. Then McDonald's, instead of giving fries, will give us juca, fried juca. I don't know if have you ever had juca or you know what that, what that is. Well, juca is a, it's very South American. Um, I don't know how to explain it. It's like a, a plant, and it, you, you eat it. It's, it's actually really good. <laughs> but um, the, you can fry it. And, and because they ran out of potatoes, they started giving fried yuca. You know, they're being creative businesses. And suddenly, you know, then there's no fried yuca, and then there's no lettuce, and then there's no tomatoes, and then they'll just give you, you know, bread, maybe. Um, and then there's, there's nothing, and then they just close down. This is how socialism begins to change your quality of life. And it might seem silly because I'm just talking to you about burgers and, and junk food, but imagine that in every part of the economy, right? And that's just shortages in a restaurant. Then you go to the grocery store and you have to line up to, to buy your items. And the line is first five minutes, then it's 10 minutes, then maybe it's an hour, maybe it's two hours. Maybe in the country with the largest oil reserves on the planet, now you have to line up for gasoline. Maybe the country that used to be the world's number one exporter of oil and a place that welcomed millions of refugees and immigrants from all over the planet now becomes an importer of oil and an exporter of people. The number one exporter of people, actually, since Venezuelans are today the largest refugee crisis on the planet. More than Ukraine, more than Syria, more than Afghanistan. Yet nobody invaded Venezuela. There's no civil war, the population has no guns, right? There's no Second Amendment, we don't have such a thing. And then there's also no you know, use of chemical weapons against the population. We don't have a, you know, a religiously authoritarian dictatorship that is forcing women to, to wear burqas or anything like that. People flee simply because there's absolutely no opportunity to progress where my family, which was probably like many of your families, making a few thousand dollars a month in the early 2000s, went from that to making $100 a month in 2016 when I left. That's obviously an unsustainable situation, even if you don't have to pay for your house because you own it like, like we did. And so when people ask me actually, you know, Daniel, what do you think is the worst part of socialism? It's actually not the shortages, it's not the hyperinflation, it's not um, you know, even the crime that we had, which was huge. It's actually the consequence of living in that, which is family separation. It's that seven years ago, I was leaving Venezuela almost today. Uh, I, I left July 31st, 2016. And it was my grandfather giving me a letter for the last time, telling me you know, how proud he was of me, but how he understood that I had to leave and, you know, not see him until very much later. And that's much worse than having to line up for food for one hour, you know? It's, it's that love that you have for the people that, that, that have been with you for your whole life, and that then you have to, se to separate from them. And of course, I'm lucky, you know? I can see my family, they can come here now. You, of course, miss a lot of important moments in their lives. But that's the worst part of socialism. It's not even the suffering. It's the consequence that whole towns, whole buildings are emptied because people have to leave as a consequence of that. And that doesn't just happen in Venezuela. That happens in Cuba, that happens in Nicaragua, that happened in the Soviet Union, that happened in Eastern Europe, that happens right now in North Korea. And a lot of people think, because you know, I just told you a lot of really sad things, you know, not having electricity to perhaps, you know, not having water services, a lot of things that you go from living like a middle class family to living like somebody in, in, in a town in the 1800s. Um, this is sad, but then you wonder, well, Daniel, you're, you're telling me it's really sad, obviously, socialism is bad, but why did this happen and what can we learn from it? And how does this matter to us here in the United States now? Why do you speak about it? You know, a lot of people come from different countries, a lot of people go through different experiences. And the reason I speak about it is because we have to understand why this happens. This doesn't happen because we have bad people in power. Obviously, there are bad people. There are bad people everywhere. 
Most of Latin America has very corrupt governments. Most of the world has very corrupt governments. We have very corrupt politicians too in the United States. But it's not about the intention. It's about the policies and the sins, the system and the incentives behind it. In fact, I, I, I don't remember if it was Milton Friedman who said that the success of, of a political system is not determined whether it has good people in power, but whether the political system can encourage bad people to do the right thing. If he didn't say that, then you can attribute that quote to me. I'm not sure. Uh, but I know I heard this somewhere. Um, so that's what we have in the United States. We have a constitution, a system that protects our freedom, that separates power, distributes power, decentralizes it. And that allows not one person to have power over our lives. In Venezuela, the opposite happened, right? First, democratically, which is why it's an important lesson for us to learn. Venezuela is the only socialist country that ended up this way through elections. There was no uh, violent overthrow of the regime, even though Chavez had tried that in 1992. He failed, went to jail. Uh, very bad politicians pardoned him allowed, and allowed him to become president. Um, but he, he won his election. And the people voted for him because Venezuela, even though it was the richest country in Latin America, in the late 90s, and before that, it was actually the fourth richest country in the world. Even though we were that well off, obviously we were not perfect. Venezuela had gone through a, like a banking crisis in the 90s, and that allowed leftist politicians to sow resentment and tell the population that the rich are rich because the poor are poor, and therefore you need to elect me so that I can take power away from them and give it to you. We can redistribute the old money, we can guarantee free housing, free food, free healthcare, free education. What else? Free gasoline? Yes, free gasoline. Um, environmentalists didn't enter the equation yet here. Um, and all of this had a cost. Even though oil prices went from $10 a barrel in 1999 when Hugo Chavez took office to $100 a barrel by 2008, we're talking about in less than 10 years, that was not even enough money in, the, in an oil-producing nation to finance all their welfare programs. So how do you think if you're getting literally free money from the ground, and that's not even enough to finance all these socialist programs, that we're going to be able to do it in the United States where we don't have money coming up from the ground, right? Yet the consequence was inflation, right? You know, the government needs to spend the money. Where's the money going to come from? It comes from printing it. And Obviously, when you print a lot of money, uh, when you increase the money supply too quickly, then you get inflation, which is what we had during COVID-19. The difference is in scale. And with inflation, I don't mean, you know, like 10% inflation. 10% inflation was actually, we, we never had 10% inflation during Chavez. That would have been actually an amazing state. 20%. And 30%. Then 50. Then 100. Then 1,000. Then a million percent. A million percent, so that you understand what this means, is prices doubling every week. Something costs $10 today, 20 next week, 40, 80, 160, 320, and we still haven't gone through half of the year, and it already went from 10 to, three, to, to over 300. So that's what we went through. And it was not from one day to the next. It was step by step, policy by policy, overspending, Blaming the businesses for the inflation, it's their greed, it's the greedy corporations to fall for all our problems. And so can, what can we learn from this situation, from this refugee crisis, from this failure of socialism? Obviously, Daniel, we understand that socialism doesn't work. I think everybody understands it in this crowd. The question is, how do you take these lessons to your college campuses, to your schools, to your families, to your friends, and you protect? the things that we do enjoy here in the United States. Well, one of the, the ways we do that is through gratitude, right? Venezuelans elected Hugo Chavez because they weren't grateful for what they had. Right? I didn't vote for him. I was a baby. But I'm suffering the consequences of that. And the way you stop that from getting into your heart is by being grateful for what you have. Today, Venezuelans say not that we can't become like Cuba, because we are now like Cuba. It's that we were rich, but we didn't know it. You guys are rich, and you just, well, I, I imagine you know it now, but, um, 
But you guys need to understand with this phrase, what I mean is not rich in finances, right? Which you certainly are, by the way. You're certainly in the top 5% of the world income distribution. Um, but I don't mean it in finances. You're rich in education. You're rich in your family. You're rich in love. You're rich in community. And when socialism takes over, and when people become poor, all of those things fail. There's this myth that poor people are happier. This is actually completely debunked in social sciences. Poor people are much un more unhappy. So people in poorer countries are actually much less happy than people in rich countries. You can look this up anywhere. Um, GDP per capita is very highly positively correlated with uh, happiness, self-reported happiness at least. And, and so, you know, let's get that out there. That doesn't mean that money buys happiness. But it does mean that if you are struggling to buy food, if you are lining up for food, if people have to leave your country, your city, your community to have better opportunities, then they're separate from their families, of course they're going to be unhappy, right? Who's here from a small town? A lot. You know, something we have in common, I'm not from a small town, I'm from the biggest city in Venezuela, Caracas. You know, used to be over five million people. Um, but we have something in common, which is that I think a lot of people in small towns feel like their towns, a lot of people have left. You're not with your high school you know, friends, how many of them still live in their small town and, and families are, are spread all over the United States. And of course, that's something that hurts you. But you can still visit them. Many of them are much closer. In Venezuela, I'm talking about when, with family separation of friends is that two thirds of my high school class left the country. This is especially among young people. Left the country. I don't mean move to a different city an hour away, or five hours away, or 10 hours away. I mean thousands of miles away. You'll never see each other. Maybe you can catch up through Instagram one day, every five years. And that's it. There's no high school reunions. There's nothing like that. And my concern today, though, is that obviously we have a threat from the left. So we certainly do. You know, there are actual politicians in this country who support the same policies that destroyed Venezuela. There are people like Ilhan Omar, there are people like AOC, there are people like Chesa Budin, who was the uh, district attorney of San Francisco. Um, there are people who support the Venezuelan regime through their policies to lift their sanctions, that the, like the Biden administration has done. You know, I, last, last, last week? No, this week, right? This week. I went to, for the first time ever, to a courthouse, the Southern District of New York courthouse uh, in Lower Manhattan. I live in New York City. And I went to see a hearing of somebody, a criminal, a narco-terrorist specifically. Uh, our Constitution guarantees us the right to be in judicial processes. You know, anybody, it's open to the public. This man is a Venezuelan who was extradited from Spain. He was captured by the United States government in Spain. Great, great thing. And he's indicted on narco-terrorism charges, drugs and weapons trafficking, he, many more things. He, he was a general in the Venezuelan army. He violated human rights. A horrible man, right? And I go up. I can take pictures, right? They take your phone away because you can't tell, you're not allowed to take pictures in, inside a courthouse. Um, but I, I go up, and I enter this beautiful room. I see through to my left. We're in the 14th floor of a courthouse, the Empire State, all of Manhattan. You can see on the left, in front of you, the seal of the United States with the eagle. Uh, and then you know, suddenly from the right, the door opens, and this guy with his orange shirt comes out, coughed. And I think, wow, God bless the United States of America, right? <laughs> Where we do justice. <laughs> Now that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of thing I want to see more of. Um, and, and that's special, right? We would never have that justice in Venezuela. But there are people, you know, those, those are threats from the left. And, and I think you guys are aware of those and why free markets work and profit incentives matter. But I'm afraid that we're also losing that from the right. Because we have not just an economic threat in the United States, we have a social threat. The degeneracy that comes from the left. I mean, everything from transgender ideology, you know, the, uh, the abortion uh, rights movement, even though we've had many wins, there's a lot of threats too. One of the first things they made me do when I was a college freshman coming to the United States was a walk of privilege, where if you were a woman, 
you had to take a step back. If you were, say, Hispanic, you had to take a step back. If you were a man, you take a step forward. If you were white, you take a step forward. You know, everything. And then they try to mix up things that make like lessons, like, did you have internet at home? And like, you take a step forward. I'm like, okay, well, that's like a different category from like race and sex and all the other stuff. The, the goal of this activity was to brainwash the incoming freshmen, especially the foreign student freshmen, right? You know, immediately pull them into the leftist ideology as soon as they step off the plane. And, uh, and say that in the United States, people based on their race and sex and any other arbitrary category don't have the same opportunities as everybody else, right? Every, you know, people are unequal, there's implicit racism and, and all these things, the patriarchy, whatever. I ref refused to participate in this activity. I told the teacher as soon as I saw that this was that this was a, like a leftist thing and not something else. I'm like, I'm not going to participate. And she's like, What? What do you mean? She was like, Oh, well, I don't think somebody ever told her that they weren't going to participate. This is not an, an evaluated class. I don't care. You know, I didn't come to the United States so that I wouldn't be able to say what I thought, right? Otherwise, I would have stayed in Venezuela. And, and then the te she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I don't believe that you are telling the truth in that people have less opportunities. Like, women are inherently disadvantaged in US society. You know, this is not Iran. Or that, uh, you, know, um, you know, blacks or, or Hispanics or, or Asians or whatever are, are inherently disadvantaged or advantaged. I think people here work for that, and that's why people come to this country. And, you know, she let me go. And so obviously, this is a huge threat from the left. The question is how we face it. I think that the way we face this threat is by standing up for ourselves, is by us going to these fields that we feel have been captured by the left, like academia, like, I don't know, I can think of many fields, you know. Now business, the business sector, I feel, is getting captured by, by the left with the woke corporations. The way we do that is not by using the government and giving more power to the government over our lives. Because right now there are many people on the right who feel so disempowered that they think the only solution to the woke movement is to give the government power over our lives. Is that why don't we have the government appoint people to corporate boards? Which is happening, you know, this is actually a proposal from some Republicans. Um, why don't we have the government uh, sanction or, or give out tax breaks and, and subsidies based on our favorite corporations? They call that rewarding your friends and punishing your enemies. I call that corporate cronyism and corruption. Do you really think that giving the government the power over doing those things is going to help you? If you think that, then you have not actually talked with government employees. Because the government employees are extremely left wing. And if you think that giving more power to the government is going to help conservatives, you're very mistaken. You committed the same mistake that Venezuelans before Chavez committed. Do you think Chavez would have been able to do everything he did in Venezuela had he not owned the state owned oil company? But he did. And it was not because he actually took it over in the first place, it was the democratic governments before him that did it, that gave him that power. The more power we give to the government, the more power we give to these wokes. And that's what we need to understand. And we need to understand that the government is not a substitute to your own individual action. That's actually relinquishing your own power. Because you get in your head that, oh, I'm going to be discriminated if I go into academia. They're, they're going to fire me. Or if I go into this, the business sector and I say what I think about the, the, their social agenda, then they're, they're going to fire me. Guys, this is not Venezuela. Nobody's going to kill you because of what you think. Hopefully, you know, but they'll go to jail. But this is, this is not the same. If you don't stand up for your rights now and you don't try to take over these sectors yourselves, the government and nobody else are going to do it for you. And so my call to you is when I say we were rich but we didn't know it, isn't just about financial, isn't just even about your family, isn't just about love, it's that you're rich in rights and you're rich in a lot of power that you yourselves have to shape the United States and shape your own future. You guys can change the culture. It's not just about the government. That doesn't mean either that the government shouldn't advance socially conservative and, and, and values. There's, there's ways to do it. 
But you have to be smart about these things. There's a lot of people who will tell you, oh, America's becoming a leftist nation because of immigrants, and therefore we need to stop immigration to the United States. And I don't mean just illegal immigration. Guys, the woke culture didn't come from immigrants. It came from Americans. I'm sorry to tell you. I'm sorry to break the news. They're actually trying to indoctrinate us, not us to you. If you want to ask immigrants, you know, just, just ask the Muslims in, in Michigan what they're protesting against the wokes in, in, in the school boards. Just ask the Latin Americans. Just ask the Asians who, are, who just overturned affirmative action themselves through their lawsuits on the Supreme Court. It is not about that. You have to be, it's about education. It's about corporations, sure, but it's about your own individual action. We can't scapegoat other things and then think the government is going to solve the problem for us. That wouldn't be a conservative thing to do, to say that the government is going to be our savior. That is actually a utopia. In a way, those people on the right who want to grow the government in order to save us from this cultural attack are just like the socialists, utopians who believe the government is the solution to your problem when it's not. And so my challenge to you guys today is Take the story of Venezuela, that hardship that we've been through, all the people who have left, and use it to your advantage to prove, one, to your friends, that socialism doesn't work, and it's not because you know, they were corrupt in Venezuela. There's plenty of corrupt countries in the world. There's plenty of sanctioned countries in the world. There's plenty of terrorist countries in the world. There's only one country, or there's only a few countries that created this misery, and those are the socialist countries. Those are the countries that violated private property. Those are the countries that destroyed businesses, that took them over, that over-regulated, that over-taxation, and all these things. That's what you need to tell in your message. And then, to encourage you to use your careers to pray, you know, hopefully if, if you're a Christian, but if you're not too, you know, to use your careers to advance or shared mission. I want to be, for example, uh, you know, I'm teaching a class at Columbia for undergrads, um, and I want to be a college professor one day. I could have said, why would I, become, why would I even pursue that? I'm not going to be allowed. And so it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And then you wonder, oh, the left took over everything. I can't believe it. We need to have the government put quotas for conservatives in academia, right? That's not the thinking that you need to get. You need to try to, and you yourself use your career to advance these principles. And so that's my, my encouragement to you, so that in 20 years from now, you're not in my spot saying, we were rich, but we didn't know it. Because you guys are rich, and now you know it. Thank you. All right, we're going to start q and okay. okay, Let's start Q&A now. If you will just come up, you can walk to the back, line up where you normally would. Just state your name, where the school you go to, and a brief question. We also have an additional note. We want to invite anyone that might disagree with Daniel um, to the front of the line. Hi, Mr. Martino. My name is Rico. I go to Gettysburg College. Um, it seems like you're very pro-immigration because of some of the lectures I've heard and because it helps um, our economy, but are we possibly underestimating the negative effects that immigration can have on our nation's culture? You mentioned that immigrants are getting woke from American culture, but they are on average far more left-leaning than their parents and most Americans, with 71% registering as Democrats. Would it be prudent to limit immigration so we can more effectively root out Marxism and leftism from the US? Thank you, great question. Well, let's begin. You know, first, by the way, one of the provisions that I love of the Immigration and Nationality Act is that anybody who's been a member or supporter of a communist or totalitarian party is barred from immigrating to the United States. I support that. Um, so that, that's on one sense. Now, you are, I think that's a great question about, you know, oh, this immigrants registered Democrat. What I meant with being woke, by the way, if you just see any polling of immigrants in the United States about social issues. Immigrants are more pro-life. Immigrants think that this whole, uh, you know, uh, the, the gender stuff, it's all nonsense. So on the issues, on the social issues, they're much more conservative. And that's where I think on the right, we need to appeal to immigrants. But I can assure you that if you say, we want to limit migration because we don't like how immigrants vote, you're not going to get more immigrants to vote for you. Um, you're actually going to get fewer of them to vote for you. 
And so that's on one end. It's about strategy. It's about messaging on the issues. They're more conservative. And then, you know, uh, the, the cultural part. There's a great paper by two German um, economists that talk about how immigration changes culture. And it's a very interesting thing because what they argue is that they use the World uh, Value Survey that asks people about religiosity, number of kids that they want to have, religion, you know, many, many areas uh, of their opinions on social issues. And actually, immigration around the world has not changed their destination countries to become more like their origin countries. It has changed their origin countries to become more like their destination countries. In other words, Mexicans coming to the United States don't make the United States more like Mexico. They make Mexico more like the United States because they communicate with their families back there. And immigrants are self-selected. An immigrant in the United States from a specific country is not like the average person in that specific country. That's a big mistake. I heard the other day something like, oh, you know, all the Latin American countries are electing socialist leaders. Therefore, they're going to elect socialist in the United States. But that, that shows a lot of ignorance, because what you don't understand is that a lot of the people who come here come specifically because they hate the governments they're coming from, right? You see this in any uh, election data. So all the elections, uh, most Latin American countries allow their citizens to vote if they live abroad. So Colombians, uh, Colombian Americans, Peruvian Americans, Chilean Americans, uh, Argentinian Americans, Brazilian Americans, Venezuelans, uh, other, and other countries, those are the main ones in South America, all vote for the right-wing parties at home when their elections are. So then the question is, if they vote for right-wing parties that stand for basically the same as the Republican Party here in their home countries, but then when they come to the ballot box in the US, they vote for the Democrats, what is going on? Maybe it's not a principles issue. Maybe it's a messaging issue. Maybe it's that they've been lied to, and I can assure you they've been lied to, and told, oh, Republicans are racist. How do you break down that myth? We need to break that down. The answer to break it down is not to say we want to exclude immigrants and stop being America, the country that, that welcomes people. And we decide on mean open borders, by the way. We can talk about this. I don't believe in any of that. But, but the point is that you know, we, we need to stay a welcoming nation. We can't turn our backs on people. And that we, we need to be doing is, is having a good messaging. And I think that's been working in the last few years. Um, and finally, the, only, the last thing I'll say, a lot of people point to like Hispanic polling and look, oh, Hispanics vote Democrat. This is actually a big problem. If you look at the literature on something called ethnic attrition, by the third generation, the grandchildren of a Latin American immigrant, half of them identify as white, not as Hispanics. Therefore, when you look at Hispanic polling, you're not actually looking at the impact of Latin American migration completely. You're looking at only a sample of it. And if you adjust for that, they're actually completely like natives in voting patterns, by the third generation at least. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Daniel. My name is Jens Pfeiffer. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Washington. I've heard people argue that sanctions, particularly against corrupt countries like Cuba and Venezuela, have a much more, uh, um, they hurt the people, the average citizen of those countries, much more than they hurt the governments. Uh, and so they don't have the effect we want them to have. Uh, what's your opinion on that? How would you respond to that? I'll tell you, I want more sanctions uh, for Venezuela. Uh, and I'll also tell you, not, every, not everything is made equal here. Uh, the sanctions that exist against Venezuela are sanctions only against the regime. You can send cash, you can send medicine, you can send food. In fact, there are companies that send food door to door from the United States to Caracas. No problem at all. Um, so there, there's really no sanction against the ordinary Venezuelan. The sanctions are against trading with members of the regime, which I fully support because these are crooks who destroyed our country, and I want them all in prison, not just sanctioned, like Hugo Carvajal. And so, in fact, I would encourage to capture them and bring them and, and put them in jail. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I, I, that's why I just I think that that's completely debunked in the Venezuelan case. And there are countries that are actually much more strongly sanctioned, like Iran, that are doing much better than Venezuela. Why? Because Iran might be an Islamic terrorist state, but Iran is not a socialist country. That's the big difference. So, and then, you know, my favorite one is that, you know, if all these socialists hate the United States and all these countries hate the United States, why do they want to trade with us? I thought we were the bad guys. Or I thought we were doing them a favor. You know, so I think that that's what you can use. Obviously, not all sanctions are made equal. Some sanctions will affect the population in some cases. And the question is, is it a worthy trade-off based on your political goals?
Uh, hi, my name is Caleb Nunez, and I really enjoy your insights on free market e economics, and you're inspiring me to hopefully get my PhD in economics one day. However, I have many concerns about the economic impacts of low-skilled immigration. Thanks to the inner workings of Ted Kennedy's 1965 Immigration Act, high-skilled immigrants have been crowded out by low-skilled immigrants coming from third world nations. He has illustrated numerous times that the wage differential between immigrants coming prior to 1965 was positive, and it has just been declining, and now it's negative. Additionally, the welfare dependency is significantly higher among these new migrants compared to the migrants prior to 1965. Obviously, not all migrants are poor and destitute. However, the statistics do tell a damning story about the trade-offs of immigration. Should the United States adopt a more discriminatory immigration policy by establishing a points-based system that emphasizes education and skills? And when I mean discriminatory, I mean uh, in all immigration policy, you have to discriminate between who you want to pick and who you don't want to pick. Yeah, of course. I mean, we already have a system where we choose who we want to pick and not. Uh, the question that you ask is whether we should have a different system that prioritizes skills. And I fully agree. And I will tell you this about the literature on migration. A lot of people will tell you, if you just have more immigrants, that's bad for the wages of natives. And they just think, you know, oh, I took, you know, no offense, but like I took Econ 101 and therefore I know supply and demand and if I raise supply, wages go down. That's not how it actually works. First, because there's not one labor market. Right? The, physical, the physics engineer doesn't compete with f the physician in the doctor's office. Completely different professions. There, it doesn't matter. One, one, you know, more physics engineers is not going to reduce the wages of physicians. Right? That makes sense. And it's the same thing with every profession, uh, and especially between high-skilled and low-skilled. And so what does change, though, is relative wage impacts. So low-skilled migrants certainly compete more with low-skilled natives. Though most of the people that compete against them are also migrants. Um, I do think our current immigration system is very restrictive of high school immigration. I disagree with your characterization of pre-1965. Pre-1965 was not this high skilled immigration paradise. It was actually a racial discriminatory system that we had only for basically Europeans to come. Um, and I would want people of any race and any origin who are highly skilled to be able to come to the United States. That's the system I support, and that's what I advocate for. Hi, my name is Clara. I go to the University of Alabama, but I'm from Brazil. Um, as an immigrant, what are your plans and what do you do to help this country be a better country? And if you have any plans to help your home country? Thank you, Clara. Uh, Brazil is going through its own uh, bad government right now. Um, Look, uh, you know, my, I, I mean, I, I speak about my experience. I think that that's one way I, I try to do it. I have this organization called the Dissident Project, where we send immigrants who lived in authoritarian countries to speak at high schools at no cost to tell their stories. So we have people from North Korea, from Hong Kong, from Eritrea, from Zimbabwe, from Cuba, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Iran. And they can go to any high school. You guys should let me know. And we can, we can hook them up, and, and they'll do an event and talk about their experience to the high school students so that they get there before the college indoctrination machine. Right? That's the goal. And so that's, that's what I'm doing, and that's what I want to encourage uh, others to do. Hello, Mr. DiMartino. I'm Oliver DiMartino, and... Whoa! Right? This, uh, without a space or with a space? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. With a space. Good! It's important, isn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I'm from Concordia University, Irvine, and yeah, I was going to ask, do you think we're related? I came from... <laughs> it's it's not... a very common Italian last name. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Well, so actually, my real question is... <laughs> okay. No, be, the, people ask me because there's actually a really bad regime member in Venezuela who has the same last name as us oh dear. And from a different area. And like, I have to make it clear to our Venezuelans from the Western part that, like, no, I'm not related. I've never met him. He's like totally different. Yeah. Happily, I've never run into that problem. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so my question is, you, you brought up something that I thought was really interesting, which is use your career to go into a place that is under liberal control. And yes. to share this message, share a conservative message, share a conservative perspective. Uh, something that, I'm from California, and so something I've been impressed with uh, being at YAF 
is an attitude of like, wait, you're in California, how can you live there? You know, what is it like when nobody disagrees with you? And that surprises me and makes me feel like we should think more about treating it more like a mission field almost, like mm. go to where you can actually make a difference instead of going to the echo chambers. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I would say that that's a great thing that you said that, so that we can also change the culture here among us and instead of encouraging others to move out from those places, actually say, you know, like, you know, just don't demonize that, right? You know, I live in New York City, right? Uh, I've been asked, you know, like, for example, in the gym, somebody asked me where I'm from or something. I'm like, oh, I'm from Venezuela. Uh, but I, and I, when I came here, I lived in Indiana first. And everybody, you know, all the libs in New York City are like, oh, you lived in Indiana? Uh, and they're like, and, and then they start asking whether people were racist to me in Indiana. And I'm like, no. And, uh, you know, and like, I mean, pe and then people have only gotten mad to me in New York City, not in, not in Indiana. People are very nice in the Midwest. So, you know, like, they're, they're, you can always persuade people that way and, like, j just be an example. So, yeah, I, I don't have much to add to what you said. I think that that's a good way to call out conservatives in general so that we can all, you know, advance our mission everywhere. Thank you. Hey, Daniel. So my name is Cameron Jones. I'm the chairman of YAF at ASU. And I actually wanted to um, ask a sort of two-part question in one question. It'll make sense when I ask it. So um, I very often, uh, uh, I consume a lot of left-leaning media because I run on the philosophy of know thy enemy. And I very often hear the hear the argument that Venezuela wasn't really socialist, and I don't I, I don't agree with that. And even if they were socialist, they only failed because of embargoes. Now, you, <laughs> you might have actually already answered this question. I heard the word sanctions before, but I unfortunately wasn't paying attention. So if you've already answered that question, I'm oh, sorry. Thank for, you, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm sorry for re-asking it. Just kidding. Uh, but what, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all excuses, right? Um, but then one question is, okay, if Venezuela's not socialist, where has socialism ever been tried then, right? Because I can also say the United States is not a free market paradise, but it would be disingenuous of me to tell you the United States is a socialist country because it's not a free market paradise, right? Uh, you know, so it's kind of like the same thing. If they can only say that their theory only has never been tried, then my theory has never been tried either. And if you want to compare your utopia, let's compare it to mine, right? So, so let, we have to compare realistic things, right? What is socialism about? Government, not go, well, collective ownership of property. How does it work according to Marx in the own Communist Manifesto? The first step is socialism in which the government takes over private property. We end, abolish private property. That's what socialism is about. That's the main tenant. There's others. With the goal, of communism. Communism is a system which in, in reality has never been tried because it will never occur, in which people don't need the government to own the property. They collectively share the product of their labor voluntarily with others, which is obviously never going to happen uh, because you're not going to give away what you work for to strangers. Um, and so that would be, would be my answer. Under the textbook definition of socialism, under Marxist definition, which is, I think, what we should care about, Venezuela is on that way of, of socialism, right? Socialism isn't a black or white switch or a turning on the lights and turning them off. It's a spectrum. You know, one end is North Korea, in the other end maybe is Singapore, right? Or, or Hong Kong, you know, Hong Kong now not so much, but, but Singapore. And the further you move towards North Korea, the more socialist you are, and the further you move away, the more capitalist you are, a free enterprise, a free market. And, and I think Venezuela is pretty much on that end, just not quite like North Korea, of course, and around, and like Cuba. And if people tell you, another argument, you know, sanctions, of course, that I think I've already debunked that, you know, there's other countries that are sanctioned that have no problems like Venezuela. And the other one is that, oh, Venezuela is just another case of the resource course, that you are dependent on oil, oil prices go down and everything goes bust. Well, I haven't seen people starve in Saudi Arabia despite them not having how to plant food, right? or farm, right, farm. Uh, I haven't seen people starve in Dubai when oil prices go down. I have seen people starve in Venezuela. What is the difference? We actually at least can get bananas from the street because there are trees everywhere, and mangoes. 
You can't do that in those deserts. The difference is that those countries aren't socialists, even though they're complete dictatorships, right? There's no democracy in the UAE or in Saudi Arabia, because it's also not about democracy. All these people who glorify democracy, and I'm not saying democracy is bad, it's, it's, it's okay, we need it, but the reason these countries are prosperous and ours is not, has nothing to do with democracy, has nothing to do with corruption, has nothing to do with sanctions, and everything to do with free markets versus socialism. Thank you very much. All right, we'll take one more question. Hello, uh, Mr. Dr. Daniel D. Or, sorry, not Mr. a doctor, not a doctor. Mr. Dan Daniel D. Martino. Um, we, there's a lot of talk about, uh, my name is Gregory Self, I'm from Dallas Baptist University. There was a lot of talk about uh, the immigration system and possibly changing it to make it more reformed and ensuring that the immigrants coming here are more skilled and educated to be in the United States. However, my question is more of a challenge. I want to ask that the immigration system, as we have been talking about, I believe is not necessarily a fault of the process of the immigration, but the impl implementation. Um, I had a grandmother for six years has been trying to come over to the United States, and they have the system in, in place where they check backgrounds and education, but it, it's mainly uh, influenced a lot by bribery and corruption, and my question to you is, how can we combat the corruption that's happening? May, may I ask you some questions about the specific case? Absolutely. Uh, are your parents U.S. citizens? My mother uh, was not a U.S. citizen. She was born in Mexico City. My father wasn't a U.S. citizen. Okay, and your grandmother is whose mother? My mom's. Okay, uh, the, you know that, that's 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 where the the issue comes from, right? You know, one of the big something people don't know about the immigration system. I, I don't think it's actually about the implementation. Surely, you know, I put out a paper with the Manhattan Institute talking about how we can accelerate processing times of legal immigration forms, uh, which have skyrocketed since the Obama administration. Um, but it's not just Obama's fault, it's also Trump's and Biden's. It's like, this is a bipartisan problem. Um, but it's also a law problem. Like, before 1996, even if you were undocumented, for example, if you were married to an American, you would be able to you know, fix your legal status. Most people think that that's still the case. That's not the case. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that in our immigration system that because the law is written the way it's written, for example, you know, the children of high-skilled legal immigrants who maybe are a physician in a hospital who are from India waiting for a green card, they'll have to wait for the rest of their lives, they'll never get it because there's caps based on the number of, of people from each country. It's discriminatory based on when you were born. Um, the, those, the kids who were foreign born but came here, say, at one year old, went through pre-K, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, they were here legally their whole lives. When they turn 21, they have to self-deport out of the United States. And that is not an implementation issue. That is the law. The law is bad. We have to change the law. Right? And so, you know, most people don't know about these issues like this. They think everything is about amnesty and border security. And everything, when we hear comprehensive immigration reform, everything's like, oh, Republicans with the border security in exchange of amnesty. The big issue in immigration is not amnesty or border security, it's how we attract the best and brightest so that we can grow our economy, innovate, create jobs, and beat China in the technological race. But when you talk about that and you tell that to the Democrats, they say, no, we want to legalize the illegal immigrants. And when you tell it to the Republicans, they tell you, no, we won't do anything until we fix the border. And therefore, nothing gets done, and China wins, and we lose. And this is why I care about immigration. Right, that's it for our Q&A. Thank you, Daniel. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you.